We want to say welcome to our visitors. We're glad that you're with us tonight. We want you to stay around after our worship service so we can visit with you uh, a little bit. I believe our crowd tonight is a little bit bigger than this morning's crowd. And that's always uh, a good thing. When you come to the book of Revelation, you're coming to a book that's very powerful. It's a book that's very much misunderstood. But when you understand the backdrop and the setting of it, the two chapters that we're going to look at tonight, chapters 4 and chapters 5, is going to be more significant. It was around the year 96 AD of the first century. John the Apostle, probably the last apostle alive, has been exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the gospel, for the kingdom, and he's suffering persecution and tribulation as a result of him being faithful to the Lord. He has seen multitudes of Christians die for the faith. Uh, all of his fellow apostles at this point were probably dead as a result of their faithfulness to the Lord in various parts of the world. The church was being persecuted, imprisoned, exiled, killed, and it seemed as if the church was going to become extinct. It seems as if the cause of Christ would be snuffed out by the powerful Roman Empire. And on the Isle of Patmos, Christ reveals himself to John, his beloved friend, reveals himself, gives him messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor, in the first three chapters. And that brings us to chapter 4. We see the pitiful condition of the church. We see that all doors were shut to the church on earth. Emperor Domitian was a, an enemy of Christianity. He had set himself up as a deity. Uh, emperor cult worship was all throughout the Roman Empire. Christians were being forced to either bow down to Emperor Domitian and submit to him, calling him Lord, or face persecution or death. That was their alternative. Therefore, as a result of that, a, a revelation of Jesus Christ was given to encourage those Christians to remain faithful. But not only to them, but for all Christians of all generations to remain faithful faithful in the face of persecution and tribulation. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 says, After these things concerning the messages to the seven churches of Christ in Asia, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 says, After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me saying, Come up here and I will show you things that must take place after this. We understand because of the setting of Revelation that the things of Revelation were things that were going to take place in a short period of time. Revelation chapters, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We know that it was signified to John or given in symbols in those same passages. And so John is seeing a vision. He was told, John, what you see, write in a book. And so he sees a door open in heaven. All the doors on earth had been shut to Christians. All their opportunities had been cut off, as it were, by the persecuting forces of the Roman Empire. But God's door was still open to his faithful people. And it says in verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one who sat on the throne. Verse 3, He who sat there was like jasper and a sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne, there were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
This is really a follow-up sermon from our last sermons on last Sunday night, where we talked about Jesus is Lord. God is still ruling on his throne. And as we look at this artist's rendition, I know it's kind of dark, but this artist is trying to depict what we find in Revelation chapter 4. There is a throne in heaven, and there is one on the throne who sat on the throne. God was still reigning on the throne. Even though Domitian was on earth reigning in the most powerful empire on the face of the globe, God in heaven was still ruling and reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God had not stepped down from his throne. He is still in control. And therefore, John needed to see that. The Christians of the first century needed to see that in the face of their persecution and tribulation. And brethren, don't we need to see that as well? Don't we need to know that God is still ruling? That he is still in control? And look at the description, verse 3. He who sat there was like jasper and sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Verse 4, and around the throne there were 24 thrones. And on the throne I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. As you see in the picture here, the one on the throne, the emerald-like rainbow around the throne. You see those 24 elders sitting on their thrones, and they are given crowns. That word crown there is the word in Greek, Stephanos. It means a victory garland. That was the type of crown a person would receive in the athletic games who would win in their athletic competitions. It's not talking about a diadem, a, a crown of rulership. They were giving, given victory crowns. And they are before the throne, 24 of them. Perhaps referring to the Old Testament and the New Testament, all of God's people, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. The numbers have significance in the book of Revelation. Also, you see before the throne, the seven lamps burning, representing the Holy Spirit of God. The seven spirits of God, the word seven meaning sevenfold in the sense of being complete, God's Holy Spirit. He being a person of the Godhead just as the Father and the Son. And notice verse 6 of Revelation chapter 4. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Verse 8. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. Again, this artist is trying to depict this. You have these four living creatures before the throne. Some believe that this is symbolically pointing out the powerful angelic beings that are before the throne of God. The cherubim that you read about in the Old Testament. One like a lion, another like an oxen, another had the face of a man, another like an eagle. Each one having six wings and eyes in front and in back. In other words, they could totally take in the presence of God. They were in his presence and so they could see him completely. Notice also the lightning proceeding forth from the throne as God's power is being displayed before John. John, in the situation that we described at the beginning of this sermon, needed to see that. Because John needed to know that Almighty God was still in control. That Almighty God was still ruling on his throne. And those four living creatures that are before him, look at verse 8. It says, they do not rest day and night saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They're worshiping God day and night and they're worshiping him, calling him holy, holy, holy. It's reminiscent of 
Isaiah chapter 6, where it talks about the seraphim flying about the throne of God. They're crying out, holy, holy, holy. Saying that three times, perhaps for emphasis or for the fact that there are three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The threefold nature of God. And so they are worshiping God Almighty and they're praising Him. And they do not rest day or night. And they're praising and worshiping Him. What we have to understand as we look at the book of Revelation is we're going to see that this is a book full of signs, full of symbols, has a message, but it's also a book of worship. And friends, if you don't like worshiping God now on earth, you're not going to enjoy heaven. You'll be miserable in heaven because heaven is a place of worship where God is adored, where God is worshiped, where he is exalted day and night. So we must learn to enjoy, and every faithful Christian will learn to enjoy the worship of God on earth. And that will be certainly enhanced in the presence of Almighty God in heaven. Look at verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Notice their attitude towards God. They have a sense of awe and reverence toward him, towards him. They don't have the concept that you find so often in the religious world today of God is my buddy. Friends, that's blasphemous. He is our friend. He is the best friend that we will ever have. But we have to approach him with reverence and awe because of his majesty and his power that's being displayed to us in Revelation chapter 4. And so these 24 elders are falling down before him and they're saying, verse 11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So here's one of the reasons why we worship and we praise Almighty God is because He is the Creator. He created everything. And therefore, as a result of that, He is worthy of our glory and honor and power to receive that praise and adoration from us because He created us. He's our Creator. And they do exist and were created because of Him. That brings us to chapter 5. Chapter 5, we're still in the throne room of God. <clears throat> Verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. You cannot see it very good in this picture. But there is a scroll right there in the hand of the one sitting on the throne. And this scroll had seven seals on it. Here is a rendition of a sealed document with seven seals on it. A sealed document was a very important and very certified document in the ancient world. They would have scrolls like that and the king would have a signet ring he would place wax on the ribbon and he would place his signet ring in that wax or in the clay and leave his inscription certifying that this is an important document. So if it had one, one seal on it, that depicted something important. Well, what about seven? Seven seals depicted something completely and totally important. The, the number seven indicating a, a number of completion. And this is symbolic of God's will. This is symbolic of God's justice, God's wrath, and the one who could be able to execute God's will upon the earth. And he has this scroll with these seven seals on it in verse two. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. 
Now notice, the strong angel is not able to do that. So the strong angel is crying out, who is able to break these seals and undo the scroll and fulfill God's purposes on earth? Notice verse 3. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And so I wept, verse 4, John said, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. No one, the strong angel who proclaimed it wasn't able to do it. And it says no one in uh, heaven was able to. None of those living creatures were able to. No one on the earth was able to, none of the living humanity, none under the, the earth, that's referring to those who have died, no one in the past who has died is able to open the scroll and fulfill God's purposes. And so that made John weep. No one's worthy to fulfill God's will ultimately. Verse 5, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. No one on earth could, no one in Hades could, no one in heaven could, no matter how powerful the angel might have been. Only Christ, the only one worthy to do it. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah. Behold the one who is the root of David. He has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Verse 6. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne, in the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Again, this artist is trying to picture for us exactly what's going on, and I know it's dark. I tried to adjust this so we could see it. But in this picture here, you see a lamb. You see blood there indicating a lamb that has been slain. The lamb has seven eyes and seven horns, seven being a number of completion. Seven horns, horns symbolic of power and authority, rulership. Christ is Lord. He's King of kings and he's Lord of lords. He's ruling. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. He has those seven eyes indicating he sees all things. He has been slain. That's his crucifixion. The shedding of his blood. What did John say in John chapter 1 and verse 29? Seeing Jesus walk on the bank of Jordan, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the only one that can take the scroll and fulfill God's purposes. We see the dual nature of Christ here. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Genesis chapter uh, 49 and verse 10, I believe that's the verse, speaks of the Messiah coming out of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from the tribe of Judah until Shiloh comes. Christ is Shiloh. He is the one who brings peace. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Lion indicates power, royalty. Lion indicates the divinity of Christ. Christ is also the Lamb of God. That indicates humility, meekness. That indicates his humanity, his sacrifice. <laughs> he is the only one that can do it. Verse 7 of Revelation chapter 5. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He took the scroll from God the Father. Then when that happened, verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They're bowing now before the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And they sang a new song, verse 9, 
And they sing, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and you have redeemed to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us a kingdom and priest to our God and we shall reign on the earth. He is worthy. He is worthy to take the scroll and to break the seven seals and to execute God's justice upon the earth. When we read the rest of the book of Revelation in its proper context, we understand that he is talking about God's wrath, God's justice being poured out upon the Roman Empire. And in principle, any enemy, any persecuting force that comes up against God's people. Christ died, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. That's the gospel. That's the good news. He has been slain. He is the one through that blood that has redeemed us to God or reconciled us to God by his blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, nationality, the language that we speak, the color of skin, none of that matters in the kingdom of Christ. He has redeemed us back to God by his blood and has made us a kingdom of priests unto God and we shall reign on the earth. Again, John needed to hear that message. He needed to be encouraged by that message. Those who, the, who were the recipients of the book of Revelation in the, in the first century needed to know that message that Christ is worthy and that they will be victorious. Look at verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches and wisdom, strength, honor, glory and blessing. Now we see a second reason why we are to worship and praise God is because he is not only our creator, but he is our redeemer. He is our savior. And therefore he is worthy of our worship, our praise, our adoration, our reverence, and our obedience. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that is in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. So the one sitting on the throne, God the Father, and to the Lamb, showing that the Lamb was not only human, but also divine, receiving worship, just as God the Father receives worship. Look at verse 14. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. The 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. As we see these two chapters, and we see the image that is being portrayed of Jesus being the line of the tribe of Judah, the one who was the lamb sacrificed for us, being the only one worthy to accomplish God's will in redemption and in leading God's people to victory. There's many things about the book of Revelation that might be a mystery to us. Uh, we read it and we study it, and there's, there's a lot of things there that uh, puzzle us. But one thing we can know for sure from the book, that one thing that we can know for sure is this. If we follow Christ, we'll be victorious. No matter what. No matter what persecuting agent comes up against us. God's people will be victorious. And therefore, if we remain faithful unto death, we will receive a crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. We were in the throne room of God tonight. Seeing the praise, the adoration that went on as we looked at Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. 
If you've not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ this evening, there is still once again, by the grace and mercy of God, you have another opportunity to do so. You can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. If you believe in Him, you're willing to confess He is the Son of God, willing to repent of all your sins. We have water behind this screen. We can immerse you, baptize you into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and the Lord will make you a citizen in His kingdom and a priest unto God where Christ is the high priest. If you have done that, you've gone astray. We urge you, we encourage you to repent. Confessing your sins, come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours. Always stand and sing.